message on the other phone. Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey,
from Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, and I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight.
it wouldn't be a service for me or most other preachers if you didn't miss something. But it's a <laughs> For all the blessings of this place, we get thanks to you, great God, for families, friends, colleagues, and neighbors, and strangers, and rangers, that the love of God may grow with me, and your love, and your word, like a seed, may it grow Thank you for the 
these kids. We thank you for your love. Amen. You can quietly walk to the back of the sanctuary for children's church.
And at the bottom of the teleprompter read the stirring words, and this, my friends, takes us to the very heart of my plans and my hopes for the future of our country, which are only to see at the next line of the teleprompter nothing but the words, now it's up to you, dot, dot. Now it's up to you. <clears throat> Maybe just a little bit what Elisha felt like that day that Elijah departed to heaven in a blaze of glory on a chariot of fire. Maybe just a little bit what the disciples felt like after Jesus' ascension. Now it's up to you. My dad's family has its roots in England and there's a phrase that sometimes is made that seems to feel a little bit uncomfortable to me. What we say here in Indiana is, yikes, now what? I see this story of Elijah's departure into heaven in three ways. You've got to have three points in the sermon, right? Here we go. First, it's a very human story in the lives of Elijah and Elisha and the company of the prophets. Second, it's a story about God's guidance for the early church. And third, it is a word that God has for us today on this last weekend of June, 2019. Where has this month and year gone? So let's begin with a very human story. It was about a time of great change. It had been a place and a time where there was great turmoil and difficulty. Have you ever been in a place of change where you didn't really know what was going to be happening next? Well, of course. Have you ever said or thought or sung, I can't live if living is without you? I can recall a time when I had to say goodbye and I really wasn't ready to let go. I was in my third year of college. I was engaged and I was looking forward to a, a fun summer and planning a wedding the next year. I met my fiance after class and immediately I knew that something was not right. There was a very solemn mood and look on her face. I can't do this anymore, she said, and went on, and I didn't hear much of us, but she said after that, um, there was really nothing more to say. Maybe it was besides platitudes and tears and, and silence. It was over? Really? It's over? Well, it was, and I eventually managed to make it on, and life changed, and here we are. <laughs> Maybe that's just a little bit how some feel this day. It's a tough call whether it's harder to be the one leaving or harder to be the one that's left behind. The one leaving is heading into the unknown, the one left behind is returning to the known, but without the person that has made that known make sense. Maybe it's a good vibe of a parent to a child going to college. Maybe it's a good vibe between two lovers, between two friends. Maybe because of a job or a change of direction. Or maybe in this case, it's the departure of one who had drawn back the very veil of heaven and earth and now was passing it on to the next. Now Elisha is facing the question, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Because all he knew about the Lord was in Elijah. And so there's this really kind of curious exchange that happens. Uh, 
in the lectionary, the series of lessons that's appointed for this Sunday, it leaves out all those middle verses. But I said, no, we're going to do all those middle verses. So three times in six verses, Elijah says to Elijah, I will not leave you. It's kind of like, you know, when you're on a trip and the kids say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And each time, Elisha says, I will not leave you. I will go with you to Bethel, to uh, Jericho, to Gilgal, and on and on. Elijah is the one who has brought God's presence, and Elisha is not going to let Elijah go. It says, when Elisha, Elisha says to the company of the prophets, um, I know that. Now keep silent. He's really saying, okay, you guys, shut up. I don't want to hear this anymore, you know. I know he's going to be leaving me. This little detail of the 50 prophets standing at a distance is kind of interesting. It seems to me that whenever there is one of these big goodbyes or something important that is happening, there's always someone that's watching or someone that's waiting there who is really, genuinely, exquisitely insensitive. What do you mean you can't move on? It's time for you to move on. Get over it. And there they are. They keep rubbing it in as Elijah says that day goodbye to Elijah. I know. Okay. Time for you to be quiet. Well, we could get a good idea of how Elisha is feeling. His mentor disappears in the whirlwind. He tears his clothes in two. And if you don't have many clothes, this is a big deal. This is his robe. I mean, this was a sign of great distress. He tears his robe in two, and there he is, kind of all in all, you know. He was very distressed. It's kind of like um, after a big breakup, it could be read, tosses the photo albums into the fire and burns them. Or goes for a long bike ride, that's what I would say. Elijah is gone. You can see the tears. You don't have to hear them in the story. So there they really are, these two men. And I don't know if they exactly had the right way of being able to say goodbye to one another. Elisha is facing this great loss and also a great gain, a great inheritance. These are some very big shoes to fill. It's a tough act to follow. Sometimes I felt like, should I step into these shoes that Manzo does? No, I can't do that. <laughs> Elisha needs a blessing. And so that is what he asks for. He gets a blessing that is both tangible in the sense of the stole, the mantle, as well as the blessing of a double blessing. It is both physical and spiritual. It's a good thing that he gets both of these because Elijah has just torn his mantle in two, so it's nice to have another mantle to take out. And so this is a very human story, a story about giving up and a struggle and a transition. Now secondly, let us look at this story through the eyes of the early church. They had recently said goodbye to Jesus. Jesus had spent a great deal of time with them teaching and healing in a very similar manner like Elijah had. And there's these long farewell speeches that are recorded in the Gospel of John that give a detailed account of just how difficult it is to say goodbye. And like Elijah, Jesus promises that there will be a double portion of the Spirit. It will come upon the disciples when he is there with them in the last days, and then again at Pentecost. And just as to Elijah's departure with Jesus, there is a great whirlwind. And then at Pentecost, there is a fire. And so there's all these similarities. And heard through the gospel ears, Elisha's commands to the company of the prophets to be silent, they sound a little bit like his commands to the, Jesus' commands to the disciples. 
that, he, that they tell no one about what he has done. Elisha's insistence by the very highest authority that he will not believe Elijah is like Peter's insistence at the Last Supper, that he will not fall away even though all the rest of them fall away. And the company of prophets watching from a distance are like the women who are watching at a distance at the cross. There's lots of similarities that can be made, and that's the point, is that Elijah was one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, and so Jesus is the prophet now for them. And then there's Elijah's parting of the waters of the Jordan, which remind us of Moses and Joshua parting the waters. In Elijah, we find for the first time the image of the waters of the Jordan being like the waters of one's own death. His legacy to Elijah is that Elijah will now be able to part those waters and go into a new life, a new resurrection. Very similar, again, to the message that Jesus had. That his death was not the end, but it was the opening and the parting of a new life. And so we see here this story that helped the early church to recognize that through Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus was standing in the same tradition, passing on that which the prophets had done for centuries. The early church now has the meaning of the story that is clear. It is not for them to mourn and to look back to the way things were or to rend their garments, but it is for them to take up the mantle and to do as Jesus did, to part the waters of death the waters of fear, the waters of rejection, the waters of hopelessness, and to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the season of Pentecost is about, living in the power of the Spirit, a double portion that God has given to us. As Jesus says in John 14, anyone who believes in me will do what I have done, and yes, even greater things. Yes, that is what Jesus calls us to do, even greater things this day than were done so long ago. And so this brings us to today in these words. Now it's up to you. It's time for us to say goodbye to Elijah and to the past. That's what I mean by Elijah. What do you need to say goodbye to this day? What is it that you need to let go of so that life can go on to a new journey. The time of Elijah in some ways, 50s and 60s, were times of more certainty, and then we got into the later 60s and the 70s, and then that was the whirlwind, and things changed greatly. But we always look back. Oh, you remember back then when the church was always so full and we had so many in, in the confirmation and so many in classes and so on? Those days are gone. They've gone away. They're never going to come back again. Elijah's time is over. Now is the time for Elisha. We are the ones that Jesus has passed on the mantle. For many in times past, the word Christian was used as an adjective. As in the past, it meant to be a good Christian could be uh, uh, the uh, same as to be a, a good American. But now in this time, to be Christian is more than to be a good American, but it is to be a person who is in service to God beyond the control, beyond the direction of the politicians and the advertisers, and the pretensions of social media. Don't get caught up in all the social media. You'll go nuts. <laughs> it's always some turmoil, always some drama going on. That's not where life is. Life is where you are living and making a difference in the lives of others. Our mantle is to model a society that would not be possible without the hope and the life and the promise of our Lord Jesus. So now at this time, we get the chance not to be as parents, not even to be as adolescents, but I say to be as children who can use our imaginations, who can play in new ways,
seeing new opportunities. You know, it's just always fun. We've got a couple six-year-old grandsons, and Connie's always playing with uh, with Liam, and Liam loves to go out and dig under rocks because he's going to find a roly-poly or a snail or a worm or what else? I don't know. He's always, Mama, come and see the worm I found. You know, having the sense of adventure in the smallest of things. That is what we are called to. We are called to love, to trust, to allow love, to be loved, and to see life as an adventure. To see the church not as a parent, but as a child. Seeing the wonders of God's goodness, living in the joy and the awe of this day, because now it's up to you.
younger adults had a trip to uh, Shaker Village. So I'll take it. It looked like it was a good day. It's a neat place. And we're certainly grateful for the time that we're able to acknowledge and celebrate um, Pride Month as well as our coming nation's birthday. <laughs> All right. Let me get to the right page here and see where I am. Okay. Let's pray.
imprisoning those who should not be imprisoned and taking advantage. And so we pray, God, increase in us this day your grace, your compassion, and show us what we need to do now as we reach out for those around us. And so it is, it is our privilege to be able to join together in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So as we prepare to receive our offering, let us give out of the generosity and the gratitude which we have received from so many that may be passed on to the next generation.
things we ask in the name of Jesus, who shows us all how to live in love. Amen. So let's turn and face the center aisle and face one another, and we will join in our mission. Let us go forth into the world in peace. Be a good courage.
you go your way this week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. And so give you and our world peace.